so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Paul Rudensky. I'm the Senior Director for Education at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I am pleased to welcome all of you here to my living room uh, and here on Zoom uh, for today's lecture, which is entitled Discrimination, Degradation, Defiance, Jewish Lawyers in Nazi Germany. This lecture is part of a series of stage seminars which are designed to provide professional development and Holocaust education for teachers in Jewish schools. The museum also runs a robust series of programs for professional development for teachers in public and non-denominational private schools. And I know most of you are either teachers in Jewish schools or gallery educators. I know we have some teachers in public schools. So um, email me after the program. I'd be more than happy to let you know about uh, or to, to refer you to my colleagues who work with uh, public school education. So um, I just wanted to say a few introductory notes before we begin the lecture. This year, I've been fortunate to work with uh, uh, Carly Snyder, who you see here up above. And Carly is a doctoral student at the CUNY Graduate Center. And uh, Carly and I have had the good fortune, or I've had the good fortune of talking with Carly about various topics for the stage seminars. And one of the general topics we've been discussing back and forth is this role of law in Nazi Germany. And uh, there's lots of aspects of it. Um, and um, it's something that I hope we will continue to address in the future. But um, during her research, Carly came across uh, Douglas Morris, who is today's speaker. Uh, he's a lawyer and a legal scholar, and he's written about Jewish lawyers in Nazi Germany, among other things. So, as people who are connected with the Jewish tradition, we know that uh, one of the aspects of Judaism is a real respect for law and a cultivation for law. And it's also an important aspect of American life. And so uh, Carly and I believed and feel that this would be a really appropriate topic for us to address today. Um, so before we jump into the material and before I hand the um, uh, the mic, so to speak, over to um, uh, to Douglas, to Douglas Morris. Uh, let me just tell you a few, do a few um, housekeeping things. So our next program will be on June 14th. Professor Marion Kaplan from New York University and the author of Hitler's Jewish Refugees, Hope and Anxiety in Portugal will speak about the fascinating phenomena of Jewish refugees in Portugal during the war, which was one of the few places in Europe where Jews were welcomed. Um, and we're, from whence they were able to find safe havens. So that will be a very interesting program. Uh, for those who are teachers in Jewish schools, uh, our um, stage center, summer seminar will take place July 6th through 8th, and will focus on family re re reunification after the war. And that program also will likely go out over Zoom, but if you would like to attend, please email me and I will send you um, an application. Okay, a couple of logistical comments. Uh, Number one, please note that we will mute everybody except the speaker during the presentation. So uh, nevertheless, we do wanna hear from you, especially during the Q&A at the end. So please feel free to use the chat function to submit questions. And uh, I'll be reading those questions to the speaker after the program or after the lecture. Um, also, please note that after the lecture today, um, we'll be sending you an online evaluation form please plan to spend a few minutes completing it. Your feedback is important to us and to our funder, the Claims Conference. I appreciate your taking this task seriously. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to thank the Claims Conference for funding today's program. And I would like to take a moment to thank Carly Snyder and my, Rebecca, uh, my, my colleague Rebecca for joining us today as co-host to make sure everything goes smoothly. I'd also like to say that this is, uh, Carly is finishing working up for the museum right now, and I want to wish her a lot of success uh, in her future endeavors. And I know that she's going to be great. And uh, all of you who have attended the stage seminars or came to Yomi Yoon or were involved in other programs uh, were really beneficiaries of, of Carly's expertise and her dedication. So Carly, thank you. Thank you, Carly. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to now spend a minute or two just telling you about our speaker, and then I'm gonna hand the floor over to, uh, to Mr. Morris. So Douglas Morris, PhD, JD, is a legal historian and practicing criminal defense attorney with Federal Defenders of New York, Inc. He is the author of Justice Imperiled, 
the anti-Nazi lawyer Mash, Mats Hirschberg in Weimar, Germany, and Legal Sabotage, Ernst Frankel in Hitler's Germany, forthcoming, um, which is about, uh, okay. Uh, this later book uh, produced a classic analysis of Nazi regime and original theory of resistance. Mr. Morris also published a series of scholarly articles on 20th century German legal history. And I could send those that list to you if you're interested. Um, in addition to being a legal scholar, Mr. Morris uh, is an active uh, attorney. Uh, at Federal Defenders, he represents uh, defendants charged with federal crimes such as drug smuggling, illegal immigration, currency smuggling, gun use, alien smuggling, fraud, and occasional bank robbery. Uh, in 2001-2002, he was a fellow at the Dorothy B. Lewis Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. In 1998, he was the recipient of the Thurgood Marshall Award from the Association of the Bar of New York for serving as a pro bono counsel to a human being under the sentence of death. Um, we're really honored that uh, Dr. Morris is joining us today and taking time out of his busy schedule to address us. Uh, I'm now going to turn the floor over to Dr. Morris, but before I do, at the end of the program, we will do the Q&A. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to present um, Dr. Douglas Morris. Paul, I want to thank you very much and I uh, for the invitation, which I very much appreciate. And I also want to thank both you, Carly, and Rebecca, who have put in such effort to uh, set up this program. Uh, I want to welcome everybody who's uh, participating in the Zoom meeting, uh, certainly not under ideal circumstances, but I, I'm hoping that everybody is safe and, and keeping well. Um, and I appreciate your flexibility in terms of uh, participating in a meeting of this sort. It's the first time I've given a Zoom lecture, so I am, uh, I am uh, enthusiastic about doing uh, that. Um, and, uh, I, but I will give the same lecture that I would have in person. Uh, I suppose there's a little more distancing here, but also maybe a little more sense of intimacy as well. Uh, the only difference is that in terms of the uh, PowerPoint or slides, uh, I will uh, give uh, Farley the uh, cue for removing a slide and adding the next slide. So let me get started in this lecture entitled Discrimination, Degradation, Defiance, Jewish Lawyers in Nazi Germany. It's in, on September 11 of 1933 near St. Moritz, Switzerland, a German Jewish lawyer from Berlin shot himself to death. In late Ger January, Hitler had become Germany's chancellor. In late February, Germany's Reichstag, its parliament building, had burned. And in late March, the lawyer's partner said that he intended to dissolve their part practice together. He denied being anti-Semitic, of course, but times had changed. He needed to worry about his own family and about his own responsibilities. An acquaintance warned the lawyer. He was no longer safe in Berlin. He had to leave. And in mid-April, that lawyer did leave. He left for Switzerland. There, he suffered a nervous breakdown. He refused opportunities for work elsewhere. He obsessed about events in Germany, and he lost weight from under eating. At times, he spontaneously broke out into tears. At his funeral, fewer than a dozen people attended. It was like the burial of Willie Lohman in Death of a Salesman, a small affair that did not match the dead man's dream. As with Willie Lohman, the final respects for this one German Jewish lawyer evoked a grief chilled by loneliness, exhaustion, and disappointment, and also by a sense of injustice. But there, the similarity ends. This funeral was not for a professional failure, rather, it was for Max Alsberg, next uh, slide please, the most celebrated criminal defense lawyer of his time. Some of us have had the unfortunate experience of facing the suicide of a client or someone else wondering what drives a person to kill himself. 
Greek heroes sacrificed their lives in the hope of future fame. Alsberg ended his upon the collapse of his renown. He could not go on without the reassurances from adulating surroundings, from his colleagues, his adversaries, and his clients, from the public and his audience. He could not go on without his immersion in German law. Whatever the psychology behind his suicide, Alsberg's career epitomized the success that Jews had achieved in the German legal profession. His death marked the rollback of Jewish emancipation and the collapse in Germany of liberal law. Alsberg's lifetime spanned the rise and fall of an era of liberal law in Germany. Born in 19, he was born in 1877, the decade of German unification, when legal reform took a quantum leap forward. New national laws actualized the liberal principles of legal equality and the rise of a free legal profession, free insofar as it was freed from state control. The legal profession opened its doors to Jewish men, not to Jewish women, but to Jewish men. And Jewish men could then become lawyers and they flowed into the legal profession. They soon made up a disproportionately large proportion of practicing lawyers in Germany. By the time of the Weimar Republic, between 1919 and 1933, Jews who made up at that time less than 1% of Germany's population. Jewish lawyers, however, their proportion hovered between 25 and 30% of German lawyers. In, Ber in Berlin, almost half the lawyers were Jewish. Jewish lawyers had gained public prominence and exercised professional influence. The great German sociologist Karl Mannheim described Weimar Germany as having a cultural flowering that was unlike any since Heraclean Athens. The historian Benjamin Hett has written, and I quote him, the great lawyers of Weimar represented an array of collective brilliance that formed a fitting counterpoint to the artistic literary and scientific glories of Weimar Berlin. Please close the frame. Please close the frame, thank you. Upon gaining power, the Nazis halted Jewish emancipation and reversed it. They set in motion a five and a half year process of hounding Jews out of the legal profession. But that is only half the story. The reversal of Jewish emancipation and the elimination of Jewish lawyers was part of the destruction in Germany of liberal law and the creation in Germany of a new legal order, of an anti-liberal legal order, of a Nazi legal order. The laws from the 1870s had ushered Jews into the legal profession, but they did not simply decree a new opportunity for a specific group. Rather, they embodied new liberal principles of equality under the law, of individual rights, and eventually of democratic participation. In eliminating Jewish lawyers, the Nazis did not just uproot a specific group. They reversed liberal principles. They replaced the notion of equality with one of racial superiority and racism. They subordinated the individual to the so-called Aryan community. And they discarded democratic participation for the dictatorial Fuhrer state. Within months of gaining power in 1933, the Nazis struck their first blows, both violently and methodically. By the time Max Alsberg died in September of 1933, German Jewish lawyers were finished. The Nazis had shown that they meant to rid the German legal profession of Jews, 
and to rid German law of liberal principles. And the Nazis showed that they had an approach for getting the job done. The history of the Nazi destruction of German Jewish lawyers was all present in the Nazi attack on Jewish lawyers in the spring of 1933. The seminal event was the Reichstag fire of February 27, 1933. That was the pretext the following day for an emergency decree titled for the protection of people and the state. In actuality, it was the constitutional charter of the Third Reich, as it was so aptly described by this German Jewish lawyer, next frame please, Ernst Frankel. He made that description in a book he wrote in the late 1930s titled The Dual State. The decree purported to protect Germany against communist violence. It indefinitely suspended civil liberties guaranteed in the Weimar Constitution. It empowered the national government to intervene to restore order whenever and wherever necessary. And it transferred Nazi rule into a permanent dictatorship with unlimited power. With this abrupt transition from the Weimar Republic to Nazi rule, the Nazis created a dual state. The dual state consisted of the prerogative state on the one hand and the normative state on the other. The prerogative state was the realm of arbitrary power and official violence against which citizens enjoyed no legal protection. The normative state was not the rule of law, rather it was the legal order, and that in turn included both traditional law and newly enacted Nazi law. With the emergency decree in place, the Nazis delivered a double punch against Jewish lawyers, a jab by Nazi lawlessness and an uppercut by Nazi law. Please close the frame. Nazi lawlessness burst on the scene the night of the Reichstag fire, when police rounded up 4,000 of the Nazis' political opponents, including politically active Jewish lawyers, including this one young lawyer, please, the next frame, please, Hans Litten, the uh, heavyset man with glasses looking out from the photo in the middle. In 1931, at the Eden Dance Palace trial, Lytton had caused a sensation in cross-examining one Adolf Hitler. In 1933, his mother begged him to flee Germany. He refused, st stating, and I quote, millions of workers cannot leave, so I must also stay put. End quote. The Nazis took Litten and, other, and others into protective custody. Under the rubric of protective custody, the Nazis empowered themselves to arrest whomever they chose as a threat to public order or as a future threat. The notion of protective custody has no place in liberal law. The arrestee faced no charges and had no legal recourse. No judicial warrants authorized the arrests. No court orders could end the detentions. Nazi officials could make their decisions secretly and arbitrarily without heeding any pre-existing public rules, without facing any later impartial judicial review. The Nazis were creating the prerogative state a realm of Nazi action, independent of law and beyond judicial scrutiny. Those in protective custody, like Lytton, could not ask a lawyer to seek their release. But the lawyer who could not rely on legal authority could make ad hoc petitions to those in power, try to meet with officials and exploit connections. Lytton's mother, sought a lawyer for her son, she asked, 
Max Alsberg. Alsberg declined. He probably exercised good sense. Consider Michael Siegel, a Jewish lawyer in Munich. He represented a client in protective custody. He lodged a complaint at a police station. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The police arrested him. They knocked out his teeth. They tore his trousers at the knee. As you can see in this slide, beneath the knee, he's wearing long johns because it's winter in March. They marched him barefoot through the street with a sign hanging from his neck. I am a Jew and I will never again complain to the police. Next slide, please. Next slide. If you look carefully at that, those two slides, that could generate a question for the question and answer period. Uh, next slide, please. On the night of the Reichstag fire, the Nazis targeted their political opponents, arrested Jewish law lawyers, but they arrested Jewish lawyers as political opponents, not as Jews. But within weeks, the Nazis turned their attention to lawyers and judges because they were Jewish. Instead of arresting lawyers in the dead of night, they attacked courthouses in the light of day. SA men, Nazi brown shirts, uniformed thugs, stormed courthouses and occupied them. They searched for Jews and chased them away. Police invariably arrived on the scene too late. Next slide, please. One of the first courthouses, courthouse attacks occurred on March 11 in Breslau, the city with Germany's third largest Jewish population. Here is one lawyer's description, and I quote, suddenly, it was exactly 11 o'clock. We heard in the hallway a roaring as if of wild animals that got closer and closer the doors to the lawyers' chambers flew open. Two dozen SA men rushed in and screamed, Jews, out. For a moment, everyone, Jews and Christians, rose. Then most Jewish lawyers left the room. At first, I didn't budge. Then an SA man sprang at me and grabbed me by the arm. I shook him away, at which point he pulled out of his right shirt sleeve a metal sheath which he pressed, releasing a spiral with a lead bullet fastened to its end. With this instrument, he struck me twice on the head, which poured forth blood and began to swell. There were judges, prosecutors, and lawyers, many in their official robes, who were driven onto the street by small hordes of SA men. Please close the slide. The Nazis also rely on the normative state the legal system. Prerogative state accomplished many Nazi goals, but terror tactics had limits. In the short run, such tactics helped dislodge the liberal legal order. But in the long run, it jeopardized the Nazi promise of social order. In the legal system, the Nazis could advance their goals more systematically, consistently, and thoroughly. The Nazis transformed the legal system, replacing Nazi law with replacing liberal law with Nazi law, with Nazi racist law. A major step was two laws of April 7, 1933. One was the law on the restoration of the professional civil service that applied to judges. The other was the law on the admission to the bar that applied to lawyers. With these two laws, the Nazis aimed to stamp the judicial system with twin principles of both racial superiority and racism and Nazi political control. The Nazis were pragmatic in putting these principles into effect with measures that were radical, but not absolute. Regarding the racist principle, both of these laws anticipated the Nuremberg Laws of 1935. They privileged so-called Aryans 
they discriminated against Jews. Jewish judges had to retire and Jewish lawyers could be disbarred. But even regarding race, both laws set limits. Jews could continue as judges and lawyers under two important exceptions. The one exception was for senior judges and lawyers, that is Jewish judges who had entered the civil service or Jewish lawyers who had been admitted to the bar before August 1 of 1914. The other exception was for veterans, Jewish judges or lawyers who had fought on the front in World War I. The law on the admission to the bar gave the legal profession a jolt. From early 1933 to October, the number of Jewish lawyers in Germany dropped dramatically from approximately 4,600 to 3,200. That is by more than 30%. From one vantage point, most Jewish lawyers evaded disbarment, either as senior lawyers admitted before World War I or as veterans who had fought on the front. The Nazis were astounded. They had never imagined that so many cowardly Jews had fought on the battlefield. Still, many Jewish lawyers abruptly lost their livelihoods and Jews could no longer enter the legal profession. There were grave implications for the legal profession overall. The number of Jewish lawyers plunged but the number of total German lawyers fell too. For the remaining lawyers, less competition was good for business, at least for the moment, but it was an ominous sign, a step in cheapening the status of the legal profession. The law on the admission to the bar in one blow struck both Jews and the freedom of the legal profession as epitomized in the next slide. And it epitomizes the collapse of the law for the following reasons. If I could just explain this photo, in the center of it is a noose. Uh, is a it, in the center of it, hanging from a noose, is a sign which is a paragraph sign which uh, represented for Germans German law. Who ha for people had the image of German lawyers and judges always looking in their statutes. Uh, and their statutory books. And in this uh, photo, that uh, symbol of liberal law is hanging from a noose. Underneath that noose at the center with the cap is Hans Kerl. He was the justice minister uh, for Prussia uh, at the time. And this is all taking place uh, in, a, uh, in a camp for training young law students in which the focus was on physical training. End of this slide, please. How did Jewish lawyers respond? We can understand their responses in terms of discrimination, degradation, and defiance. When Max Alsberg shot himself to death, he did not rely on his skill in packing a pistol acquired as a frontline soldier. Alsberg had not fought in World War I. He was a criminal defense lawyer, a scholar, and a methodical German. Alsberg studied how to shoot himself from a text on guns. But unlike Alsberg, Jewish lawyers at the height of their careers in 1933 were often veterans. Veterans had the best argument against disbarment, and that was their sacrifice in serving their country in wartime. There were three advantages of this argument for Jewish war veterans. The first was the argument for, the first advantage of this argument for Jewish war veterans was that it came from the gut. Take, for example, Max Hirschberg, was arrested in Munich in early March. When at the police station and answering routine questions, he mentioned that he had served on the front and had been awarded the Iron Cross first class. Tired, frustrated, and indignant. 
He then leaned forward and asked the policeman to add the sentence, famous from World War I's military notices to next of kin of their relatives' death. Rest assured that the fatherland is grateful. The second argument for Jewish war veterans was that it made strategic sense. It resonated with Germans, even with anti-Semites. One veteran who had fought in the war under Hirschberg's command opposed his disbarment and imprisonment, writing, and I quote, I'm personally a big follower of the national movement, but we have enough Christian Jews who may be imprisoned. A good soldier who did more than his duty should be free, even if he's a Jew, end quote. And the argument for Jewish war veterans made political sense. It had an obvious audience. This man, next slide, please. Paul von Hindenburg. He was Germany's national military hero. He had been a general in World War I. He was president since 1925. He was the man who appointed Hitler as chancellor. Next slide, in 1933. He was the one non-Nazi who still wielded real power. Jewish veterans wrote to him. Hindenburg acted. On April 4, he wrote Hitler about the plight of disabled veterans and frontline uh, fighters. And I quote, if they were good enough to fight and shed their blood for Germany, they should be good enough to continue serving the fatherland in their profession, end quote. Hitler responded, assuring Hindenburg that the upcoming law would include the appropriate exceptions. End uh, that slide, please. Therefore, the argument for Jewish war veterans had much in its favor. It came from the gut, it resonated with the populace, and it appealed to a national leader. And it met with success as to the exclusion of Jews from the judiciary and the bar, because the most important exception, as I mentioned, was for frontline veterans. But the argument for Jewish war veterans suffered inherent flaws. There were at least two flaws, one from a liberal perspective and one from a conservative perspective. The flaw from a liberal perspective was that the argument abandoned notions of Jewish emancipation and legal equality. In privileging frontline veterans, it discriminated against other Jewish lawyers. It created a generational divide, wiping out young Jewish lawyers. It created a gender divide, eliminating women Jewish lawyers. Consider these two women, next slide, please. On the left is Margaret Berendt, on the right is Marie Funk, Monk two of the most important lawyers in Prussia. They were born in the mid 1880s, each of them first trained as teachers. They had a series of hurdles to overcome in order to become lawyers because they needed permission. First, they needed permission to attend law school. Permission for women in Prussia was only granted in 1908. Then they needed permission to take the bar exam which the Prussian Ministry of Justice blocked before World War I. Permission for women to take the bar exam was only granted in 1919. But they still needed permission to hold an official apprenticeship, which was necessary for admission to the bar. Permission for women was only granted in 1921. And they still needed permission to take the second bar exam, which was also necessary for a bar admission. Both the German Bar Association and, Ger and the German Judges Association opposed allowing women to take that exam. Permission for women only occurred in 1922. In 1924 and 25, Margaret Berendt and Marie Monk were among Prussia's first women attorneys. In 1930, Marie Monk became Prussia's second woman judge. All the while, both of these women fought to revise laws that subjected women to men, such as in marriage, child rearing, 
and earning a living. They taught and lectured on law to social workers, teachers, and women. They organized new associations for getting women legal advice, and they represented women in need. In 1933, Judge Marie Monk did not dare enter the courthouse after the law on the restoration of the professional civil service. Soon, she was unceremoniously let go without a pension. And I must say that that is one fact that gets under my skin because after World War II, all the former Nazi era judges got their pensions. The attorney, Margaret Berendt, lost her bar admission because of the law on the admission to the bar. In early 1933, 19 Jewish women were lawyers. By year's end, there was just one. Close slide, please. The argument privileging Jewish war veteran lawyers had another flaw from a conservative perspective. It was based on nationalism. At its most unexceptional, the point was simply that Jewish Germans were as German as anyone else. They were immersed in their country's culture and committed to fighting in its defense. But at its worst, the point was that Jewish Germans could be loyal to the state. Take, for example, this man. Next frame, please. The right-wing lawyer, Max Nauman, the man on the horse. In 1921, he had founded the League of National German Jews. In 1933, he wanted to convince Hitler that at least some Jews could assimilate into the German national community and could serve the Nazi state. Nauman's views pressed the limits of devotion to the state. It exposed the flaw in the impulse towards loyalty. Jews, veterans or not, could never be loyal to the Nazi state, the so-called Aryan community, and Adolf Hitler. The exception for Jewish veterans was bad for Jewish lawyers in particular, but it was also bad for German lawyers in general. And it was bad because of its underlying logic, the logic of loyalty. What the Nazis required of German jurists was loyalty to the Nazi state, to the Aryan community, and to its leader, Adolf Hitler. But loyalty generated dilemmas for German lawyers. How could German lawyers reconcile their loyalty to the Aryan community with their obligation to individual clients. Thus, the original dilemma of the loyalty of Jewish jurists previewed a larger dilemma of the loyalty of all German jurists. Close the frame, please. Different Jewish lawyers grappled with discrimination from both liberal and conservative perspectives. In facing discrimination, Jewish lawyers also experienced degradation. In 1933, in the early months of Nazi rule, there was an exodus of politically active lawyers, but others remained. They hoped to preserve their livelihoods and to weather the storm. They tried to maintain their legal credentials. Jewish lawyers were suspended and had to reapply for admission. They lined up. Next frame, please. Bruno Blau, a lawyer in Berlin, stated, and I quote, we had to wait for hours in front of the Bar Association building in the rain under the watch of the same SA robes until we were left it, let in one by one, end quote and close the frame, please. And there's another uh, photo once lawyers were inside the Bar Association building. Close the frame, please. Most Jewish lawyers responded to the new Nazi regime as liberals, as economic liberals, as member of, members of a liberal profession trying to protect their own economic self-interest, as atomized individuals, separated from other German lawyers 
and separated from each other. The struggle of Jewish lawyers for the individual economic self-interest proved a losing battle. And the reasons were Nazi lawlessness and Nazi law, the prerogative state and the normative state. Nazis leveraged early acts of violence into persistent intimidation. For example, they warned that good Germans would never seek a Jew's legal advice. Next frame, please. And as you could see in this frame, the word is the sign for a Jewish legal practice. The word at the bottom is Rechtsanwalt, which means lawyer, and pasted on top of the sign uh, is a, uh, a, a, another uh, poster which says Yuda, Jew, as a warning to stay away. In the hazy area between violence and law, Nazis pressured courts to stop assigning Jews to represent the poor and pressured companies to stop retaining, retaining Jews as outside counsel. The Nazis issued ordinances that barred, for example, most Jewish attorneys from entering courthouses. Therefore, as a result of both Nazi lawlessness and Nazi law, Clients deserted their law, Jewish lawyers. Jewish lawyers lost income, business, and their livelihoods. They were economically choked, socially isolated, and humiliated. Not Jewish lawyers experienced discrimination and degradation, first with a sudden veracity and then with unrelenting pressure. Close the frame and go on to the next frame, please. Let me now talk about the few examples of individual defiance. First, uh, in view of this man, Ludwig Bendix. During the Weimar Republic, he was a judge on a Berlin labor court. Bendix responded to the new Nazi regime as a liberal, as a political liberal in isolation, trying to assert liberal procedural values. In July 1935, after he had already spent a half a year in a concentration camp, he made a protest to the local police that an anti-Semitic sticker was affixed to his nameplate at his apartment, and that the front of the Nazi party building, he went on, displayed a panel with the, dis with the inscription, we no longer want Jews. Bendix protested that too, because in his words, it represents a provocation to every single Jew, much more so to those Jews who like us have lived in Germany for generations, but bled for Germany and love her as their homeland. End quotation. Bendix was arrested and spent the next 22 months in concentration camps. He was released in May of 1937 on the promise of emigrating within two weeks. During that two weeks, his son found him at home preparing a legal brief, denouncing the concentration camp commandant who had forced a Jewish prisoner with a heart condition to exercise until he collapsed and died. His son and daughter then, took then destroyed the brief and took turns guarding Bendix until he had safely left the country. His son later explained was his, what his father had expected, and I quote his son, he hoped he would encounter a convinced National Socialist who would give him an opportunity to explain his conduct and who in turn would show him how he had violated the law from the National Socialist perspective. He was ready to submit to an authoritative ruling, even if he were not convinced that it was correct, just so long as it was discussed and explained." End quote. Bendix wanted to engage in legal contests with others, hoping that they would at least recognize him as an adversary. And he was hoping for a legal resolution of disputes even with Nazis, end framework, end uh, the uh, picture, thank you. 
And then there was Ernst Frankel. He was a Marxist, an anti-communist social democrat. He continued to practice law. He took on political cases, defending defendants charged with opposition, incitement, and treason. He wrote anti-Nazi articles for the underground. He also wrote his classic book, The Dual State. Frankel tested the boundaries of anti-Nazi defiance. In 1935, Frankel wrote an article titled, The Point of Illegal Work. That article countered the despair of a Max Alsberg and the demoralized isolation of struggling Jewish lawyers. It was smuggled out of Germany for printing and then back into Germany for distribution. Next slide. In this journal, Socialist Bartha, the Socialist Paul. The article set forth a theory of resistance to the Nazis. It asked this question. In light of censorship, arrests, and sacrifices, does illegal work by socialists serve any purpose? It does, according to Frankel, if it takes the right form. In the point of the illegal work, Frankel, Frankel argued how a socialist commitment to the rule of law could attack Nazi power, could expose dissenting ideas to the public, and could drive a wedge between Hitler and the populace, striking at the leadership principle at the heart of the Nazi theory of the state. The critical beliefs were that resistors to try to make their attacks visible, but not themselves. They should seek to be effective, not to be martyred. But resistors also had to be willing to die for the cause. They should not buy their time. They should not wait. They should act now. Frankel concluded, and I quote his conclusion. Yes, we have become criminals. If we were not empowered by our illegal activity, I fear that we too would sink into the smog that oppresses Germany. Because we work illegally, we keep ourselves fresh. That is the point of illegal socialist work in the Third Reich, to infuse the workers with strength, the waverers with trust, the sufferers with hope, and the rulers with fear. Does illegal work have a point? What would Germany be without illegal work?" End quote. This attitude broke the paralysis that beleaguered so many Jewish lawyers. On the one hand, it implicitly rejected the stance of those Jewish lawyers who hoped to wait out the regime, to muddle through until the scourge passed. On the other hand, it offered the solidarity of political action, which might ease the pain of the economic and social isolation afflicting so many Jewish lawyers. Death, if the result of resistance, would not be a lonely act of despair as an Alsberg suicide, but an unavoidable sacrifice which would inspire other resistors. Close the frame, please. At approximately midnight of February 4th to 5th of 1938, in a latrine in the Jewish barracks at the Dachau concentration camp, Hans Litten hung himself. Next frame, please. He hung himself after the SS had murdered a fellow inmate and seemed poised to interrogate Lytton again, again brutally. He could not go on. His funeral at a crematorium in Munich was a small affair. It was attended by only his mother and one of her friends. Lytton did not last five years in Nazi concentration camps. Jewish lawyers could not last much longer in Nazi Germany. Close the frame, please. 
1938 brought the final resolution of the Nazi problem with Jewish lawyers. The fragile solution from 1933, the law on the admission to the bar, shattered in March of 1938 on the Nazi annexation of Austria and of Vienna, the symbol of Jewish cosmopolitanism and racial mixing. With the rush of events, Jewish warriors in Germany had a sense of foreboding. On June 30 of 1938, this man, next frame please, Julius Fleece, an unofficial spokesman for Jewish lawyers, wrote a letter to the Reich Ministry of Justice. He pressed his best argument. It was the same as five years earlier on behalf of Jewish war veterans. But by now the argument had lost its punch. It made less strategic sense now that President Hindenburg was long since dead. It carried less popular appeal in light of Germany's military remilitarization without Jewish participation. And it created even less Jewish indignation after five years of economic burdens and demoralization. Close the frame, please. On September 27 of 1938, Hitler signed a decree disbarring all Jewish lawyers as of November 30 of 1938, providing for a tiny number of Jewish legal advisors who were to deal with the practical legal problems of Jews and to represent the interests of only Jews. But Jewish lawyers did not rush to become legal advisors in the fall of 1938, the way they had lined up for readmission to the bar in the spring of 1933. Julius Meyer, a lawyer in Frankfurt wrote, and I quote, several colleagues have declined to apply. They want to emigrate in any case, and they don't want to roam the courts as inferior protected Jews who are pitied and scorned. There was an interruption in the selection of Jewish legal advisors. That was Crystal Night, the anti-Jewish -Jew pogrom of November 9 to 10, in which 91 Jews were murdered, 191 synagogues were burned, 7,500 Jewish businesses were plundered, and 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and hoarded to concentration camps, such as Dachau, Sachsenhausen, Buchenwald. It included Jewish lawyers, including this man, next frame please, Horst Berkowitz from Hanover. He was a badly wounded World War I veteran he had lost his right eye. He had lost most of his hearing. As you can see in his hand, he's holding a hearing aid, which is wired to his ear. He had lost part of his brain, which is the reason for it, the signature tap. His face was disfigured. His right hand, which is out of this uh, photo, is mutilated. One of his legs was impaired. Upon arriving at Buchenwald, when he could not keep up, Guards mocked him and beat him unconscious. They could not believe a Jew could have fought on the battlefield. Close frame, please. Hitler never held the law in high esteem. Theoretical subtlety was never in the Nazi's strong suit. Hitler and his henchmen cut down law and power by a decree of July 1, 1943, which handed over the prosecution of the Jews from the administration of justice to the police, from the normative state to the prerogative state. By that time, Jewish legal advisors had already lost their clients. Nazi Germany had already deported almost all German Jews to Eastern Europe for murder. 1942 had been the Holocaust's deadliest year. I would now like to make some remarks in conclusion. This story is one about the fragility of democracy. When a substantial minority voted for a demagogue who whipped up hatred and racism, who trafficked in lies, who scorned democratic standards. When enough other people went along pursuing their own ambitions, not believing that the demagogue was serious or not caring what he did. This story is one of the collapse of democracy and the rise of tyranny as illustrated through German 
Jewish lawyers, such as this man next frame, Max Nauman, a Jewish veteran who lacked, who lacked the conceptual categories for a new era and responded with illusions that he could preserve his old nationalism and show loyalty to leadership in the teeth of reinvigorated anti-Semitism, racism, and cruelty. It is illustrated through the example of, next slide please, Ludwig Bendix, who held on to his conceptual category of liberalism, fighting to preserve his own ability to debate and his own dignity, who stubbornly, compulsively, maybe even insanely did that, perhaps embodying the biblical aphorism that surely oppression makes the wise man mad. It's illustrated, next frame please, by these two women, Marie Monk and Margaret Berendt. In the whir of events, their hard fought gains for women for treating women with equality and respect slipped away without a whisper of protest. Next slide, please. It's illustrated by this man, Hans Litten, an impassioned lawyer who probably would never have imagined a legal justification for torture, but suffered torture perpetrated by those with, in the words of the historian Claudia Kunz, a Nazi conscience. It is illustrated, next frame, please, by through Horst Berkowitz, a lonely man who experienced mockery, an ideology of mockery, despite being a war veteran, but because of his handicaps and his disability. It is the story of Ernst Frankel, next frame, please, who cared about blue collar workers, who knew of the need for resistance, and also who saw the costs of resistance, a resistance that included sacrifices and death. Next frame, please. In 1938, he fled to the United States where he was admitted as a refugee. He became enamored of American democracy. He developed a theory of pluralistic democracy built on the principles of diversity mutual respect and rational decision making based on facts, analysis, and debate. Um, and it is illustrated through this man, next frame, frame please, Max Alsberg. One reason for his suicide in September of 1933 back at the beginning of the Nazi era, was that he could not imagine living outside his country, and he could not imagine living inside his country without the rule of law. And the present question for our moment is the following. Can we? Thank you. All right. Um... Uh, Dr. Morris, thank you so much for a fascinating uh, presentation um, and I think really inspiring and the, the jurists that you mentioned, uh, you summed up throughout the talk and you summed up at the end are really inspiring and uh, it's thought provoking. I'm going to open up now the chat. We closed it so we wanted people to pay attention and, and not be distracted, but I'm going to open it up now I, and I'm going to, um, let's see here. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to open up the chat. Let's hope that this works. Okay. So I would, I would like to invite people to send questions via the chat. Um, and then I'm going to pose them to Dr. Morris. And, and you know what, while we're waiting for the questions to come in, I, I had a question if I could ask. That's all right with you. Um, so you mentioned, and I, at one point I stepped away, so maybe you, you, you've talked about this, but this relationship of the Jewish lawyers as being kind of an omen for the non-Jewish lawyers, that what happened to the Jews also uh, suggested or, or prophesized trouble for the non-Jews. Could you maybe spell that out a little bit? Yeah, so I think, I think that's a good question. Thank you for it. 
um, I th the Nazi regime attacked the liberal rule of law. And the vanguard of that attack was attacks on Jews. But the attacks on Jews represented, on the one hand, anti-Semitic uh, sentiment and ideology, but was also part of the larger aspect of the ideology, which was attacking the liberal legal order. And the Jews were not going to be the only ones who suffered from the attack on the liberal legal order. In terms of lawyers, uh, Jewish lawyers were the ones who suffered uh, most acutely from the attack on them directly as Jewish lawyers, but the whole legal profession suffered. And in fact, uh, the status of the legal profession and the importance of the legal profession uh, plummeted during the Nazi regime. So that by the end of the 1930s, for example, uh, the uh, applications to German law schools had dropped off precipitously. And one of the characteristics when one reads about the history of German lawyers uh, and even of the pro-Nazi German lawyers is almost this desperate attempt to try to justify their importance in a regime in which lawyers who represented cer uh, certain liberal values almost inherently were being discounted. Uh, so in fact, the legal profession lost its status lost its influence. And part of the reason wasn't just that it's important that any particular profession uh, have status or influence, but because this aspect of the profession represented what's important to the rule of law. Um, and uh, instead, the people who became more and more important uh, in uh, the Nazi regime were uh, ambitious uh, people in the uh, Nazi party, in the bureaucracy, uh, outside of the Nazi party and its bureaucracy in the military, uh, people who were exerting power and exerting power lawlessly, who were really uh, people who uh, epitomized uh, the characteristics of the prerogative state of lawless action. And that lawless action uh, was often action which did not require the assistance of lawyers uh, and eliminated protections for German lawyers and for all citizens. So that is my, uh, one of my points, and I'm glad that you raised it, that the attack on Jewish lawyers is part of an attack on, the, uh, uh, on a liberal legal system. Okay, thank you. And I see that I have a question here too. Um, uh, could you just spell the name of the lawyer, Margaret? Um, if, and maybe you could just repeat the name of the two uh, female lawyers that you, you had mentioned. Margaret Berendt, B-R-E-N-D-T, um, okay. and Marie Monk, M-U-N-K. Thank you. Okay. And let's see if we have other questions. Um, okay, we'll give it a minute. I hope that everybody can uh, ask questions. All right. I hey, have, I, yeah, go ahead. Berendt, B-R-E-N-T. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if I might uh, answer one of the questions that I raised about sure. the, uh, uh, the photo of Michael Siegel, um, I don't know if it, there's any possibility of getting back to the double photo of Michael Siegel with the sign around him. I think it's the fifth or sixth uh, slide there. Uh, right. Oh, we're way past it. Yeah, it's just going backwards, I think. Here we go. Oh, okay. Um, here, okay. this one. So uh, what, what is interesting about this is these are two different photos, or interesting to me and to some other people. These are two different photos of Michael Siegel walking through the street. And even if you don't understand German, you can see that much of the lettering is different. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that happen? What had happened was there was one photographer who caught this episode on the street and sent it to uh, newspapers in the Western world, in England and the United States. But the resolution of the, uh, uh, of the photo was not good enough to pick up the words uh, on the sign. So the editors of various newspapers, independently of each other, filled in the words to what they thought it meant. Uh, and they filled it in differently. Uh, a year or two later, a Nazi journalist picked up on that and there and raised that as an argument for why the Western press was uh, uh, spouting propaganda, because clearly these were two different signs 
Uh, and so both of them could not be true. And, and, and there is, today there have been attempts to reconstruct what was exactly on the sign and it's impossible to do. Wow, very interesting. I have another question here um, from Jeff Katz, who's one of our uh, gallery educators. Um, I'll read it and then uh, if you need to, I can repeat it also. With economic and social isolation amid increasing violence and intimidation, did Jewish legal professional organizations offer workshops and means by which Jewish lawyers could, would be better suited to continue as lawyers or paralegals in countries outside of Germany once they emigrated? That is a good question and thank you for that. Um, I'm not aware of any Jewish legal organization uh, providing any assistance to uh, Jewish German lawyers in Germany. Uh, the uh, Jewish lawyers in Germany were extraordinarily influential in German legal organizations. Um, and they were among the leaders of the organization. Uh, but if people have heard of the term Gleichstaltung, which in, I think the best interpretation is Nazi, Nazification uh, of various organizations, and there was the Gleichstaltung or um, uh, Nazification of the German Bar Associations beginning in March uh, of 1933 and uh, happening very quickly uh, in which the uh, Jewish lawyers were shown to the door. Uh, and the German lawyers, their colleagues at best politely said, you know, sorry, uh, I've known you for several decades, but goodbye. Uh, so they were eliminated from the, uh, from the German uh, uh, Bar Associations in which they had been so influential and helpful. Um, when they were out of those uh, organizations, they had no uh, a Jewish um, organization. There were uh, Jewish organizations helping German Jews uh, um, in general. And among those organizations were uh, people who were trying to help people of all professions, including uh, Jewish lawyers. Uh, and there were Jewish lawyers in those organizations, which were helping through the Jewish uh, social uh, organization um, and, uh, and, and putting much work into that. Also, remaining Jewish lawyers, uh, more and more of their practice involved the winding up of property matters and assistance of other people to emigrate. But there were no, to my knowledge, organizations of German Jewish lawyers um, who, um, who were assisting each other. And in fact, that is one of the reasons why I emphasize that the experience of many, if not most Jewish lawyers was an experience of social isolation. They were isolated from other German lawyers and they were isolated from each other. Okay, and I have a few more questions here. So the, the questions are starting to roll in now. Um, one question from my colleague, Anne Mollengarten is, were there any notable acts of resistance by non-Jewish lawyers in efforts to protect the position of their Jewish colleagues? Not that I'm aware of. Um, and most uh, non-Jewish lawyers uh, apologized uh, with weak apologies that there was uh, nothing that they could do. Um, there were uh, German lawyers on occasion who would not take, uh, follow the example of the partner of Max Alsberg, uh, who uh, split up with him and who might have continued for a certain amount of time uh, with, uh, with their uh, joint legal practices. Uh, in the case of Ernst Frankel, uh, who I have studied his uh, Nazi era career, um, and he uh, actually worked quite closely with two other lawyers who were non-Jewish uh, in their uh, political work. But I believe that Frankel's example is really an exceptional example and doesn't uh, uh, illustrate what was happening with other uh, Jewish lawyers. Uh, so um, at best there was uh, polite uh, apologies, uh, but uh, I have not come across anything of significance that went beyond that. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, there's a few questions that are kind of complicated, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try to summarize it. And I, and to those people uh, who asked, um, 
uh, I, I apologize if I, if I miss it. So, um, you know, one question here is, um, uh, was there more of an effort to get at the lawyers because of their potential power for good? Um, and how did that compare, if you know, uh, with how Jewish doctors were treated? Well, Jewish lawyers and Jewish doctors were both uh, pressed out of their profession. So to the extent that there's a similarity there, there's a similarity in that attempt to get out doctors uh, from the uh, medical profession, uh, very roughly uh, paralleled what was happening to Jewish lawyers. Uh, and parallel to the end, for example, when Jewish lawyers uh, were barred uh, from practicing as lawyers and can only assist uh, Jewish clients, it was similar with what happened with, uh, with Jewish uh, doctors. Um, it, what was the first part of the question again? I, I think well, I could, I'll, I'll, I could, I could uh, okay. Okay. What were Jewish lawyers uh, eliminated because they were a force for good? Yeah. I don't think, I don't, I don't think that the thinking was in terms of good or bad. Uh, the thinking was uh, of the Nazis was in terms of anti-Semitism uh, and in terms of reconstituting uh, the legal system overall. And that is what Frankel uh, really analyzed so uh, cogently, uh, so convincingly, and really cut to the heart of the matter. Um, and part of, uh, I gave some hint of Frankel's theory uh, and argument about the prerogative state, the lawless state, and the normative state, the uh, system of law. Uh, but what Frankel further argued uh, was that they were really both aiming for uh, Nazification. And there was pressure on both of those uh, trajectories uh, towards uh, uh, Nazification. Uh, the prerogative, if I just might continue this thought, the prerogative state, the lawless state, the state of, um, uh, uh, of unadorned power uh, certainly was dominant in the Nazi regime where lawlessness prevailed over law. Uh, but the Nazis understood and took advantage of the legal system and the legal system went along. And in a way, what was happening was the prerogative state was providing the model for the normative state as more and more uh, judges, for example, ruled more and more uh, along Nazi uh, ideology and Nazi policy. Uh, there was a restructuring of the courts, for example, with the establishment of special courts that happened immediately in March of 1933 of special courts and then the establishment of the People's Court in uh, the uh, spring of 1934. Uh, these courts were separate uh, tribunals set up to deal with political cases to assure outcomes which were satisfactory to the regime. Uh, but as they were set up, they also had almost a magnetic power were the decisions being handed down by the other more uh, traditional courts, which try to uh, uh, more and more uh, issue uh, decisions which were in uh, keeping with them. So the, uh, the, the Nazi regime uh, was using the legal system and trying to transform the legal system to its purpose. And, and I just, I just want to make sure so, and, and, and it was increasingly successful. In other words, the normative legal system became increasingly Nazified so that if there were parallel courts, the normative court would would issue a verdict that would be the same as a Nazi court ultimately. That's correct. And in fact, it was so successful that it uh, generated a debate in the late 30s and during World War II uh, between Ernst Frankel, who wrote The Dual State, and his former law partner, Franz Neumann, who wrote another major early analysis of the Nazi legal system entitled Behemoth. Uh, and Neumann's argument was that there was no longer a legal system in uh, Nazi Germany, that it was totally lawless. And whatever you thought was a legal system, in fact, was just a system of administrative decrees for the exercise of power. Now, there's a disagreement between Frankel and Neumann on this score. Um, but uh, the point is that 
uh, whatever the end point was, whether law was utterly destroyed or whether it continued, uh, it was being Nazified and radically Nazified. And certainly by the time of World War II, uh, Franklin had devised his thesis uh, and his argument before the war and before the uh, Holocaust and extermination of Jews. But by that time, uh, there was no doubt that in Frankel's term, the prerogative state had the overwhelming upper hand. Fascinating. Let me just ask you one more question, because really we're, um, we're, we're, we're out of time, but I'll just ask, and, and maybe you could just answer briefly. Um, and for those people whose questions we didn't get a chance to ask, maybe I could send them to you by email, um, if, sure. if, if, that's, if that's okay. Um, and I apologize, I know we have a few questions here that I know are great questions and people would like to ask, and I apologize to you for not presenting them, but we are actually over time. Just the last quick question is, um, did some of the judges who left, uh, were they able to return uh, to, uh, to Germany and did they pick up their legal profession after returning? Uh, well, the answer, we have to think about both lawyers and judges. There are rare examples of lawyers and judges who return. The interesting uh, twist to that story is that they were not invited back in general. They were not welcomed back in general. And there were often roadblocks put up uh, against their uh, returning. And it is a sad and sorry story, but it is part of a larger story of how former Nazis uh, tried to uh, justify what they had done or to hide what they had done and rewrite what they had done while they remained in power uh, and kept out of power uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, people who had been previously uh, Jewish lawyers uh, in uh, Germany or Jewish judges. Uh, there are exceptions. One is Ernst Frankel. Ernst Frankel had determined he was never going back to Germany. But in 1949 and 50, he was invited back to the Free University of Berlin. Uh, he began making visiting lectures there and ultimately wound up um, uh, uh, teaching permanently uh, there. Uh, he felt that he had a moral obligation to do that, uh, that he had a moral obligation to help to educate the new uh, generation of German law students. Uh, and, um, and to uh, develop and to teach his theory of pluralistic law, which was in part an introduction of many, or an integration of many also American legal values into, uh, uh, into post-war uh, West Germany. So there were exceptions, such as Ernst Frankel, but uh, maybe a, bi a bigger story is the way many of these uh, former lawyers and judges were actually kept out. And many, of course, were not going to go back under any circumstances uh, anyway. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, really thought provoking and, and interesting and gave lots of depth and inspiration as well. Um, and uh, with important applications, as you, as you alluded to at the end. Um, I want to thank everybody else for joining us today. The next stage seminar will be uh, June 14th. Um, I ask everybody to, well, I thank you again for joining us. I want everybody to stay safe um, and be well. And I'll be sending out a um, evaluation form in a few minutes. So please, if you would, please respond to that. And uh, we're going to end now. And thank you. And I'll, and, and I'll give you a call in a few minutes, Douglas. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, your patience. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.